So I guess we could go back to the early 1900s, uh, right when we had the Industrial Revolution. What, what folks have to understand is there is a controlling network, a controlling apparatus that runs the show. So folks who believe that the president runs the country or a prime minister runs the country, those are just figureheads in front of the curtain. So like in The Wizard of Oz, you got to pierce the veil, look behind the curtain to see the great Oz. Going back to World War One, first of all, all of the wars that are created are created by the controllers to benefit the controllers. So this is something else that we have to understand. So our entire reality, everything, just about everything that we interact with from the standpoint of touch points and going shopping, buying a car, buying a house, buying land, uh, going to work, that is all controlled by them. This is their reality. They have put it in place and we operate within it. Like many people don't understand that as an example, when you buy property, you don't, you never actually own the property. You rent it. Take a look at the contract that you signed. That's why there's property taxes. Property taxes is a perpetual lien against the property that many people believe that they own. So I'm just pointing that out to try to put a frame around what we're talking about here. So back in the early 1900s, there was a gentleman by the name of Alistair Crowley. Alistair was a, an occultist, uh, a black magician, and he also is the founder of the religion Thelema. And as Crowley went about his ways, he was also uh, a, a British agent working with uh, the British military and intelligence during World War I. Uh, as an occultist, he was held in very high esteem by those that are in power. Uh, so what Crowley did, and the reason why I'm just setting it up is he had an ideology, he had a philosophy that goes back to the Egyptian mysteries. And what we have to understand is all of this control mechanism, the people that are within it, especially the higher up the chain you go, they're occultists. The world is run by occultists. So Crowley had to find a new age, what he called the Eon of Horus, what many people are referring to today as the age of Aquarius. Prior to the age of Aquarius was the age of Pisces. And Crowley defined that as the age of Osiris. Now, in his teachings and his philosophy, he put forth a premise that the old age is ending. The age of Pisces is ending, what roughly equates to his age of Osiris, and a new age is coming about. It's the age of Horus. It's the eon of Horus, the age of Aquarius. Because there are cultists, there's a process of alchemy in order to bring about transformation. That alchemical process says that when you move from one point, point A to point B, in this case, from one age or one eon, the eon of Osiris to the eon of Horus, or the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius, it's not just a matter of just moving there. You have got to break down and remove everything from the previous age. You can't have any remnants of the old if you're going to bring in the new. So what we're going through, what we have been going through, especially I put the stake in the ground since 1960, but it was going on before 1960. But 1960 is when they started putting the pedal to the metal. So what they're doing is they're systematically breaking down the old structures, the traditional values, as an example, family values, going after, quote, institutionalized religions, in particular Christianity, because it was the most dominant. And so they're breaking it all down and they invert. As an example, they'll take a lot of Christian symbolism and they will invert it. Even today, we, but the rainbow is flipped, it's inverted, because the rainbow represents the chakras within the human body. There's seven primary energy centers within the body, and the top is purple. Red is the base chakra. Crown chakra, purple, is enlightenment. It's awakening, and it's turned upside down. What, so what we're going through is an alchemical process that the cultic elite practice and what they're putting forth in order to bring about their new age. Now, their new age is, many people are going to refer to it as the new world order or the one world government, but it's going to exist with a lot fewer people. We've all heard about Agenda 2030, which is a checkpoint within Agenda 21. So Agenda 21 
is the overall uh, transformative plan that they have in place. And Agenda 2030 is a checkpoint within the overall project plan. So after 2030, there'll be Agenda 2040, 2050, 2060, mm -hmm. 70, and so on. I believe that their goal is by the time they get to the year 2100, that's their plan. That's when they believe they'll have the entire thing, the, the world transformed. They plan not only decades, but centuries in advance. And because all of the people and the organizations that run the world, they're bloodlined. Okay. So they just keep passing the baton along and they, they view it as time is on their side. And that's how they do their transformative process. Right. We have to understand folks that there are two different worlds. There's the world we operate in, which I refer to as living outside the pyramid of power. So they're inside the pyramid of power. We're outside of it. Their world is inside. And the two worlds are completely different. They get different education. It's just a whole different way of life and perspective about what life and living is all about. In their minds, they are the ultimate controllers. It's them. It's a battle. It is a battle of good and evil. I, it is a, it's a spiritual battle. Okay. They know the truth about reality okay they tell us that the mysteries and uh the gods of mythology are all comic book types of stuff you know don't pay any attention to that those gods never really existed that's something you go to a movie to go watch you go to go watch thor i never discount mythology because mythology through history going back to the ancients this was a way that they were able to express the the true structure of reality and because they're occultists and because they go back to the ancient mysteries, they're also knee deep into magic and ritual. See, that's the other thing. A, a lot of folks don't believe that that stuff is, is real. You know, they think it's just Harry Potter stuff, but they practice ritual and occultism every single day. One of the tricks of the trade that the controllers do, part of their whole occultism and their ritual and their magic and all that stuff is to keep you busy. It's to keep you busy with inane stuff. It's to keep you distracted. It's to keep you in front of your television set. It's to keep you engaged with music. It's to keep you worshiping the lesser gods. What happens is they, they people worship the the uh, the athletes. People worship the politicians. People worship the the Silicon Valley icons, the so-called icons. Uh, they worship their entertainers, their celebrities. They worship all of these people. So when you worship folks. What you're doing is you are disempowering yourself because you are giving up your authority. It's a narcissistic society. That's what the that's what the controllers have created. So social media was created by the controllers. Everything that you interact with was put in place by them. And it's all put in place to a couple of things. One is to distract you. Two, it is to dumb you down. Three, if you're on Facebook, Instagram, and all these other uh, social media, these platforms, uh, they are data collection entities. And uh, in fact, Facebook was funded by the CIA. So whenever you're interacting on social media, what happens is all of this information is being, is, is being funneled into the AI. And this allows them to be able to, to really get a much better understanding. They're really starting to get pinpointed now with regard to human behavior, how humans will react, how they will behave given a certain set of circumstances or situations. This is the thing. You can we can win this, but people have to wake up. People have to stop participating in all of this garbage that they're giving us. Get off of Facebook. Get off of all of these platforms. We have to disconnect from this stuff. So part of the plan and part of the strategy of the control is is convenience. It's to make things very convenient because convenience then creates the feeling that you don't really have to do much. It's you become docile, and at times people. Many people even become apathetic. The plan they have in place is full spectrum dominance. That's what it's referred to. But we can break the code. And the thing is, we have to push back. We have to not, not participate in their schemes. We have to become aware when a psychological operation has been put into play. We have to learn to say, no, I'm not doing that. We have to resist. So all of this scheming, all of this this strategy, all of this social engineering, all of this social transformation emanates out of Tavistock. So Tavistock is in the business of mind control, brainwashing, and social engineering. It got its start back in the 1920s 
it was connected into, um, and, and still is today, British military, British intelligence. And then it became the Tavistock Institute in 1947. Sigmund, Sigmund Freud was their poster child. And Tavistock's tentacles are everywhere. They have adopted occultism as part of their approach and ways of doing things. Drugs is a big, big piece. So we had the process. I told you about uh, Alistair Crowley, and he's got his eon of Horus on the horizon. And that's what they're looking for. That's how they're defining the age of Aquarius. That's how they are defining it. That's not necessarily how it's supposed to pan out. Everything they do, David, is not organic. Everything they, they do is not natural. Everything they do is engineered. So starting in the 1950s, they were all put in place, whether the artists knew it or not, as part of a social engineering initiative to alter the very fabric of our society and our culture. And I'm talking about worldwide. So when Elvis came onto the stage and, you know, he's shaking on the stage with his hips and all that stuff. I mean, this was stuff, this was something that was not seen before. We get past Elvis, we get past the 1950s, and Tavistock creates the Beatles. The artists are participating in their scheme, whether they know it or not, knowingly or unknowingly. So the Beatles were huge because really the Beatles were the first major music pop rock initiative that Tavistock put out there that was uh, defined to change the world, transform the world worldwide. But, you know, it was the clothing, it was the hair, it was during the interviews, it was the attitude. If you go back and play the old interviews, there was pushback against the establishment. That started to come across in, in the interviews of not only the Beatles, but the Rolling Stones were also a creation of Tavistock, as well as the entire British invasion, the bands going back into the 1960s, going into the 70s, as well as all of the other genres that followed. We have punk rock, we have glam, metal, hard rock, techno, rap, it's all part of Tavistock's agenda. So the turning point for the Beatles as far as their impact to social engineering was the psychedelic era. So in 1967, which was considered, referred to as the, the summer of love, that's when LSD was introduced into the mainstream of society, full blown. It, it started with the Monterey uh, Pop Festival, which was organized by John Phillips, uh, the guy that's playing Paul McCartney, whose real name is Billy Shears. So the guy that's playing Paul McCartney today is, is not the original uh, biological Paul McCartney. Um, the original Paul McCartney was replaced. He disappeared back in 1966, late 1966. The Beatles were a very occulted entity. And I'm not talking about the individuals themselves, but I'm talking about the controlling apparatus all around the Beatles. It's knee deep in Crowleyism. It's knee deep in occultism. So biological Paul McCartney in all likelihood was part of a ritual sacrifice. But the Beatles' main impact was the introduction of the psycho, uh, excuse me, the psychedelic era, the introduction of drugs into the culture. And they had a major, major impact, especially with the release of their album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Starting uh, when Billy joined the band in late 1966, Paul allegedly died September 11th, 1966. So September 11th is a very occulted date in the occult. But the Beatles were really the foundation. They were foundational to all of the music and the genres that came forth after that. Because as I mentioned, the Beatles were steeped in the philosophy of Aleister Crowley, his religion, Thelema, and occultism, which includes ritual, ceremony, numerology, gematria, alchemy. Music and entertainment, we talk about entertainment, of course, we're talking about Hollywood. Music is used, folks, to steer you. It's, it's, to, it's to give you a certain mindset. It's to get you to adopt certain morals, ethic, beliefs. It's to get you to move in a certain direction. Uh, music, sound is extremely uh, important to human beings. Certain sounds put through music can subconsciously move you and steer you in a certain direction. Lyrics, backmasking. It's just a whole toolbox of stuff that they deploy in order to, to social engineer and transform societies and cultures. So we have to not shut any doors on this, folks, because what's going on today, if you can't see it, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's going to change. It's changing the very fabric 
of our reality and how your life and your kids' life and your grandchildren's lives are going to be. But you've got The Doors, you've got uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Frank Zappa, Jimi Hendrix. You know, you've got The Beach Boys, um, you've got The Monkees. There are those that are, they're there, they're placed in certain positions because they're bloodline. As an example, this guy, Billy Shears, who's plays the part of Paul McCartney, he's in the system, he's bloodlined, he's supposed to be there. He was identified early on in his life to be in a position, a very powerful, influential position down the line. And he was shaped and molded to be there along the way. There are other artists that are not bloodlined, um, but they might be they might be in a secret society. So if you're in a secret society, as an example, you're a Freemason, right? And you have your oaths, which they can they call their obligations, then they're going to be developed as well because their oaths supersede and override anything else. So there's a very, very high level of confidence that they're going to stick to the game plan. Then you have this other tier. The other tier would be people that are not in secret societies and not bloodline. They're just folks that have some skill. They have some talent. So what happens is Tavistock keeps a, a pool of resource. They've got their tentacles everywhere and they bring people in. Hey, we can do this with that person. If we shape them and mold them the way we need them to be shaped and molded, appearance wise, the type of music or their acting, whatever it may be, we can move the agenda forward. They're going to help us move the agenda forward. And these folks in all likelihood are not even aware that they're doing this. Let's face it. Who doesn't want to be a rock star? Who doesn't want to be a famous band? I did when I was a kid. That's how I got into all this. And this goes on everywhere. So, you know, fame and fortune in this world is, is not achieved by luck. There is a machine behind it all. And this is what I try to explain to people about the Beatles. So you don't achieve that time of that type or that level of prominence, fame and fortune if you don't have a major league machine behind you pushing you along. Right. David Bowie was introduced because David Bowie was the beginning of testing the waters for androgyny. No, that's not natural at all. I mean, why no. is it natural that a man would go dress up and look like a woman with big hair and makeup and go out and play guitar? All of these genres are are created. It's a strategy that emanates out of Tavistock. Tavistock rolls in under the Committee of 300. OK, so the Committee of 300 are 300 people. They call themselves the Olympians. Read this book by John Coleman, The Committee of 300. He lays it all out. Coleman was an insider, used to be with British intelligence. If you want to learn about Tavistock, David Estelin's book is a good book. I don't agree with everything that David has in the book, but 90, 95% of what he has in here is rock solid. Hollywood started getting into, uh, into high gear with the Eon of Horus as well. So when I talk about the Eon of Horus again, folks, again, what I'm talking about is the transformation we're currently going through. We're seeing... The, the destruction of the old, and that's why we're seeing all of this decadence, and they're taking us into a different, this is their plan, to take us into a different age, an age where it's it's all about, it's it's pagan-based. I, I, I don't associate with any particular religion. I'm just telling you that's where it's going. It's pagan-based. You can call it Luciferianism. You can call it uh, um, Thelema, which is Crowley's religion. You could talk about it as the cult of Dionysus, the cult of Pan. Pick one. That's what it's all about. So if you think what I'm saying now is not good, it's just only going to get a lot worse if you don't wake up. You were not born into this life to live a life like that. That's being imposed upon you. It's a battle of will. It's their will versus your will. People say to me, oh, Mike, your music has a Beatlesque sound to it. I said, well, I used to say I was influenced by the Beatles, but now I, I say I'm influenced by Tavistock. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Sheesh. 